Hello, pros, polishers, book revisers, copy editors, query writers, and agent seekers. The gusts of NaNoWriMo's furious drafting are now be well behind us in the rearview mirror, and, and so many people in the NaNoWriMo community, so many writers in general, in fact, are navigating this thorny labyrinth of getting published. It's a scary thing, it's a daunting thing, it's definitely a journey. And for some people, it starts with the search for an agent, which is actually one of the questions I hear most frequently. How do I find an agent? I'm here with my co-host, Brooke Warner, who is a seasoned writer, editor, and publisher. And I bet you've been asked uh, that question a lot, Brooke. Yeah, in all kinds of ways. Sometimes writers I work with will wonder, you know, can I get them an agent? And I always tell them it's not exactly how this industry works. For writers who are more realistic and proactive, there are tons of places to begin that search, including the acknowledgments pages of books that are similar to yours or Publishers Marketplace, which is a fantastic resource to see what's being bought and sold by agents to publishers. And I always recommend that aspiring authors start following agents on Twitter. Uh, you can go to to writers conferences to meet agents face to face but the important thing that writers need to know is that an agent really has to love your work and feel like they can represent it and so what that means is that the writing and the story or at least the concept really stands on its own so even if my best friend were an agent she wouldn't take on a client just as a favor to me and as much as we live in a world where it matters who you know and who can open doors for you the book and the writing itself is ultimately what seals the deal between you and your future agent. Yeah, I get asked, how do I find an agent a lot? And I feel like sometimes people want me to simply open up my address book and call up an agent and give them a shortcut, which I can rarely do because I mainly know my agent. So my address book actually isn't full of agent contacts or the agents I know I don't know all that well. Um, but that said, I, I do encourage people to ask the question. Um, so I don't want to discourage anyone. I ask it, uh, or I've asked it when I've been looking for an agent. And it's, it's good to work your network because if you know of anyone with an agent or who knows agents, uh, one of the best ways to actually get your work out of the slush pile and on an agent's desk is with a personal introduction, but, but only if it's appropriate, um, only if your work is, is what they represent and whoever you know thinks that it's, it's, it's a good fit. In the vast majority of cases, though, you have to do a lot of the legwork, a lot of the legwork you mentioned, Brooke. Um, and I used to loathe the agent search process, which resembles my other least favorite thing in the world, doing a job search. I think looking for an agent can be fun, though. Uh, for example, one of my favorite parts of looking for an agent is actually researching who represents my favorite authors and then going to their websites and seeing who else they represent and, and what other authors their agency represents. It's one giant rabbit hole that gives me an interesting view into the publishing world. I feel like a, a private detective snooping in people's lives, and I learn a lot just by poking around. Brooke, I bet you've seen good agents and bad agents as an editor. Can you share any stories or tell us what to watch out for in terms of an agent? Yeah, I mean, good agents are those who stick with their authors through thick and thin and who truly want the best for their authors. I think good agents are transparent with their authors and they don't make false promises. And that doesn't mean that they're not hopeful or that they can't engage in hyperbole or trying to manifest an outcome because that is part of generating excitement for a new project or with a new author. But it does mean that they're honest about what can really happen or they're up front and forward about a strategy. You know, we'll start with this tier of publishers, for instance, and then move on to a second tier and then dot, dot, dot. Uh, I think sometimes agents aren't really letting authors see behind the curtain of what their long-term strategy might be. And of course, some agents have the luxury of only taking on the brightest stars and the biggest talent coming out of various writing programs or people who are slam dunks because they're already hugely famous or they have gigantic author platforms. But for the majority of us normal people looking around to secure a book deal with a traditional publisher, there's just not going to be a ton of hype or that kind of interest around our projects. And so for that reason, it's going to be a process and therefore it's all about fit. So I don't like agents who sell the author on a dream over reality. And I've heard every horror story you can possibly imagine. Most common is agents who ghost their clients, right? Who are super 
enthusiastic initially and then the book isn't selling and then they just fall off the radar and that can feel so punitive you know when in fact the author did nothing wrong and the issue of course is that these things are hard to know in advance and so oftentimes a writer is just so excited that someone is going to take them on and then they don't ask the hard questions or they don't feel like they have any agency in that relationship because there's a mystique about agents and they're going to be the ones who are going to open the doors and they're your ticket to a book deal. Uh, and they are, and they can be those things, but that doesn't mean that you, the writer don't have any control over the situation. So you can ask for references. You can do due diligence about this person that you're choosing to enter into a pretty serious and long-term relationship with. So I encourage authors to ask the hard questions so that they don't just jump at the first person who comes along offering to represent them. And then to have faith that if an agent is interested and they're a good agent, they're not going to pressure you to sign with them on the spot and they should be open to answering questions. Yeah, the, the, I'm glad you mentioned the the story of agents sometimes ghosting writers. I've heard I've heard some bad stories out there. Um, there are a lot of good stories too, but there are bad ones. Um, when I I remember when I was a young writer looking for agents, I think someone another agent must have shared or sold my information because I received a query in the mail telling me how, this was pre-internet actually or right when the internet was starting, and the letter said the agent was very interested in representing me, and if I paid them twenty five or fifty bucks or something like that, then they'd evaluate my work. And there was a tiny part of me, the very needy writer part, who was flattered that someone was actually asking to see my work, but I definitely knew not to pay to get a shot at representation. I think that happens out there. There are scams, so be be wary of those. But I think that's, you know, it all speaks to how odd it is to to look for an agent. It's like you're hiring someone for a job, and you, and you are because they're going to represent you, except it's not quite the same as, as hiring somebody for a job. You don't have candidates sending you their resume because they're also hiring you and they're hiring you based on the quality of your story and the quality of your platform. That is how much of a presence you have on social media or if you're well-known in a certain field. And it's that letter that troubles me sometimes um, because I know that your ability to sell the book, your ability to deliver potential buyers can play a big role in getting an agent or a publisher, especially if you're writing nonfiction. And I know you have a lot of strong feelings about this, Brooke, and, and that's part of the reason you started She Writes, I believe. Yeah, I do. And it's complicated because an agent won't make money unless you make money. They take 15% of an author's royalties and sales. So if you consider this reality, then you have to think about what makes sense for them when they take someone on. And I always think that it's books that they believe will garner at least a five-figure advance. And that's a lot of money. So it's a very high bar. And since publishers are focused on author platform, so are agents. And I think of my old analogy of traditional publishing, which I think I've shared on this podcast when we spoke to Meredith May, that I feel that the big five are like the Ivy Leagues. And it's fraught, right? Because the big five, just like the Ivy Leagues, take the best of the best, but you also can buy your way in. I mean, we're seeing the scandals of buying your way in, but I mean by legitimate ways, like paying for a library or something like that. Um, And sometimes the measures that they're using to decide who should go to those schools, just like publishing is somewhat myopic. It might be test scores or extracurriculars or whatever. And those kinds of measures are similar in book publishing. Not all of us want to go to Ivy League schools and not all of us should. And so I encourage people to think about publishing in that way. And if writers can see their trajectory as these multiple possibilities that are out there, then I think their outcomes will be a lot better. You're not guaranteed to have a positive experience just because you publish with a traditional publisher, for instance, and authors have so much more agency with this whole experience than they realize. And then this all ties back to platform. You know, if you lack an author platform, meaning you don't have an online presence, you don't have a big following, you really do need to take the time to build one. And an agent is very unlikely to take you on if you don't have anything to stand behind. And so I, for the longest time, believed that it's this catch-22 of publishing, which is that you really do need a book to build an author platform, and you need a platform to get a book deal. And so since this is the reality of the publishing landscape, writers really do have to figure out what their approach is and to be thinking about the long-term game and what's going to work best for them, given all the variables. 
Brooke, I know there's there, there's a lot of commonalities between uh, fiction and nonfiction, but there are a lot of there are differences too. And and I wonder if having a platform is as important for a novel writer as it is for a memoir writer, for instance. What do you think? I think that it's just different. So you can absolutely sell your fiction based on the writing alone. And there are those stories of breakout writers that do so. But many writers who are getting big advances for fiction are coming out of fiction programs. You remember when we talked to R.O. Kwan, how she talked about all the things that she had done with regard to knowing her community and being involved. And I think she had written all kinds of fiction pieces. She'd had a lot of articles and and essays placed. So I do think that there's a way in which fiction writers can also build their platform. It's just not as straightforward that will make them more appealing. And certainly that would garner them something like a five or six figure deal. Yeah, thanks, Brooke. Uh, The topic of looking for an agent always seems to veer in different directions that can seem quite tangential to the work itself. So I just want to remind listeners not to get too worried or prematurely defeated by this talk of author platforms and doors closing or opening as a result. As Brooke said earlier, I think the most important thing is to focus on your work itself. The work will create the platform. The work will create the opportunities. It's the thing you have control over. The joy and meaning of writing is why you're in this to begin with. And that's important to remember when you're looking for an agent because the business part of writing can can easily eclipse the more soulful part of writing. But being savvy about this process is key, which is why I'm excited to hear more from our guest today, Nathan Bransford, who I've talked with before on an NaNoWriMo webcast dedicated to this very subject. Uh, so I know Nathan is a font of wisdom in these matters. So stay with us for a super, super, super short break, and we'll be right back with great agent wisdom that will change your writing life. Welcome back, everyone. I'm super excited to welcome our guest today, Nathan Bransford. He is many things. Nathan was formerly a literary agent with Curtis Brown Limited. He started blogging in 2007, and his blog has consistently been named one of the 101 best websites for writers by Writer's Digest. I recommend the blog because it really shows how he's dedicated to helping writers uh, write what they love, navigate the publishing process, process, and successfully market their books. And I know a lot of NaNoWriMo writers read Nathan's blog. Um, Nathan is also a writer. I know he's participated in NaNoWriMo. He's the author of middle grade novels, Jacob Wonderbar and the Cosmic Space Kapow, Jacob Wonderbar for President of the Universe, and Jacob Wonderbar and the Interstellar Time War. He also wrote How to Write a Novel, 49 Rules for Writing a Stupendously Awesome Novel that You Will Love Forever. That's the kind of novel we we love to uh, love for people to write. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I know you're in Finland, so thanks for joining our podcast from around the world, halfway around the world. Yeah, it's a little chilly and a little dark here, but I'm happy to be here. Well, Nathan, we, we are talking about the sometimes dark pathway to publishing today uh, with a special focus on how to find an agent. But just so our listeners can get a sense of who you are as a writer, tell us a bit about your novels. And I'm curious how you found an agent yourself or if you're your own agent. Yeah. So um, I, I originally, did, when, I, when I first started in the publishing industry, I actually pr- kind of prided myself on being one of those people who wasn't secretly working on a novel who were, was working in the publishing industry. But then in, in, as I entered my, my late 20s, I just sort of had a couple ideas for, for novels that I couldn't shake. And so I tried one and then tried to find an agent for it, and it didn't work out. Uh, but then I had an idea for a novel of a kid who is trapped on a planet full of substitute teachers and decided to kind of go with it. I didn't set out to write a middle grade novel, but that, that idea kind of felt middle grade-ish. And I just kind of kept going with it and, um, and wrote the whole novel. Uh, I felt like I was totally crazy for pursuing a second novel after the first one didn't work out. Um, but, but I finished it in about six months, and then it was time to try and find an agent. I was an agent at the time. And so I thought that I kind of had it made in the shade. I, you know, I knew a lot of agents. And uh, so I I sent it around uh, to all of my agent friends and everyone I knew rejected me. Every single agent who I knew personally passed. But then I ended up with an agent uh, I didn't know, Catherine Drayton at Equal. 
and she ended up selling it to Penguin. And so it, it all ended up working out. And that, that one novel ended up becoming a trilogy. So even though I was a literary agent, I couldn't represent myself. I sort of compare it to being, you know, you can't, you can't operate on yourself if you're a surgeon. You kind of need someone else who's, who's going to be, have the clear head um, to, to help you through the process. Um, so I had to go through, I had to go through the, the query letter writing process, just like any other author. Wow, what an interesting journey. It's true, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because we're going to ask you about it later. But there's the common advice to start your search for agents by finding out which agents represent your favorite authors. But then sometimes those agents are big name agents who aren't looking for people or like you said, everyone you knew rejected you. So do you think it's worth pursuing those big name agents or is it better to go with someone who's younger or an agent who has less clout for your first project? I, I really recommend casting a wide net because uh, you never you just never quite know who it's going to be, um, who the person's going to be that that um, that sees the great thing in your in your book and wants to be be your champion. And there are there are pros and cons to going with the the big huge agents and the the agents who are just starting out. And I definitely wouldn't discount. Um, so the younger agents. So in, in my case, I really did start with that advice that you're recommending, which is to start with the, the agents who represent some of your favorite books. In this case, I queried um, Catherine uh, because she represented the book thief, by, um, which I really loved. And so I'm, in fact, I kind of framed my query letter about how I loved the book thief, but I was querying her with a book that was completely different, uh, which was, you know, a book about three kids lost in space. But, um, but yes, and that ended up working. So the, the advantage of, of the big agents is obviously they have a lot of clout and experience and they, um, they can really give your book really good odds and have good negotiating power and all, all those other things. But young, younger agents are, can be great too because they're hungry. They might be a little bit more willing to work on edits in advance of sending it to, to publishers because they, uh, they might just need to kind of take on some diamonds in the rough as opposed to only taking on things that are super polished and ready to go. And, you know, every agent starts with zero sales, including the, the big, huge agents. And a lot of times young agents can help break out an author, even as they break themselves out as an agent. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't rule anybody out. I think with, but one thing to look out for with the younger agents is just to make sure that they have good, solid experience and mentors. Um, by the time that I began taking on clients as a literary agent, um, I had already worked uh, at, at Curtis Brown for over two years. I'd been handling audio rights on behalf of a lot of the agency. I'd been representing um, literary estates. And so I had a huge amount of experience and I had people I could draw upon. So I was really ready to begin taking on clients. But with younger agents, you know, don't, don't rule them out, but just tr plan to do a, make sure you're doing that extra bit of due diligence just, just to make sure that, um, that they have the right experience and, and help that they can turn to if they need it. That's great, Nathan. Great advice. I'm curious because you know the, the 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 traditional path and the one that everyone's going to have to go down at some point when they're looking for an agent is the researching agents and writing query letters. Mm -hmm. But I've also heard of I, I hear of more and more authors who have found agents through more direct channels, meaning that right. they go to a a summer workshop or a publishing conference, um, and those publishing conference have, have have things like you know speed dating for agents or something like that, or agent mm -hmm. roundtables. And so, so I'm curious, uh, do you recommend that writers should check out a writing conference and take part in these events? Do they, do they really work? Yeah, there are, there are. There are there are definitely more avenues uh, to connect with agents than ever before. I would also add some of the pitch hashtags and things like that on Twitter. Um, so there there are definitely more more avenues available to reach agents directly beyond just query letters. I do think conferences can um, can help, but I, I I caution authors against going to a, a writer's conference with the sole intention of, of meeting an agent, because you're, you're likely only pitching to a couple agents at most. Um, the odds that, that you, that it's going to happen are, are relatively slim. Um, even though it does absolutely does happen. People have found agents that way books, you know, gone on to be published but as a result of connections that were made at, at, at writers conferences. So it does happen. So I, I do think it's great Avenue. I just wouldn't get your heart overly set on, finding an agent at the conference. And also, you know, think of the, your agent search holistically, do your research of, of the literary agents, come up with the, the top agents who you think just for whatever reason, based on your research are resonating with you personally, and then kind of adapt your, your pitching approach based on 
what that agent is like. You know, if that agent participates in some of the pitch wars on Twitter, then then try and approach them that way. Uh, if you happen to see that one of them are going to be at a writer's conference and you have the money to attend, try that way. Um, so I just think it, think of it holistically rather than trying to get overly set on one agent or one particular approach. That's also all, such good advice because I see people hinging so much of their expectations on that. And I, as I said, I do want to circle back to the query letter as a person who's read thousands of them. And clearly you wrote one that was good enough to land you an agent. What are your top tips for writing a good one? Yeah, absolutely. So the first one is to make sure to personalize. And the the reason for personalizing isn't because agents need to be kissed up to, but I sort of compare it to the, that old legend about how I think it was Van Halen used to include this clause deep in their writer about how they they wanted a bowl with no brown M&Ms. And they basically did it as a way to see if venues were paying attention to detail. And so this, to me, personalizing is a, a version of that. It's basically you're showing the agent that you have you researched them individually, you did the research, you're, you're putting in the work, and it tips the agent off that you are a professional worker, and it tends to bode well for the rest of the query. So when I was an agent, that personalization was important to me because I, I knew to, to sort of pay closer attention and to really make sure that I gave the, the query my absolute undivided attention, which I tried to do for all of them. But, you know, humans being humans, sometimes it gets, it gets a little bit tricky. The second big thing is to really make sure to that you're giving the agent a sense of two things. One is just showing them that you can write well. And so making sure that the query reads smoothly, uh, it's well written itself, um, but also try and write the query in the spirit of your project. So reading the query should feel like what it's like to read your, your, your novel. So if you wrote a funny novel, the query should be should be funny rather than telling the agent it's funny. If it's dramatic or suspenseful, the, the query should kind of in, um, have that flavor. Uh, and the best way to do that, my, my third big advice, is to summarize through specificity. So rather than being super vague, like uh, the query, the, the character goes on a on a uh, on a long journey to to find themselves, be much more precise about what the characters literally do. So they go to Fiji, you know, at, you know, going on a long journey and going to Fiji on, you know, on a on a on a small boat can describe the same things, but one's vague and one's specific. So all throughout the query, look for ways that you can say the same thing, but in a much more precise and specific way. Um, and that's what will really make your query letter come alive and really kind of infuse the query with uh, the, the details that bring your, the world of your novel to life. That's such good advice. Now I'm going to ask the flip side of that. Uh, what are the most common things that writers do wrong when querying? One of the things that, that I think happens is that, you know, people will listen to podcasts and they'll, they'll read agent blogs and um, and they, they, they'll hear all of these, these, um, what to do's and what not to do's. And, um, the first thing is, is I think people kind of get into a state of paralysis around the whole thing because there's so much advice out there. So much of it is contradictory. Um, and it's really, can be really hard to try and figure out exactly what you want to do. So the first is just kind of, you know, just do the best you can. Don't worry about making some minor faux pas. Don't worry about, um, you know, overthinking it and, and just, just write the best query you can and, and definitely get feedback, definitely take it seriously, but don't sort of tie yourself in knots trying to incorporate every last bit of advice you see out on the internet. And along those lines, I think people also kind of be begin to think, oh, well, I, I see all these blog posts about how agents receive 10,000 query letters a year. I want to make mine completely stand out by breaking every mold and making this totally different. And, and uh, whether that means, you know, writing it in like a pink or purple font or some other color that's non-standard or like making it like the character is sending the query and just kind of all these gimmicks that kind of th that the author thinks is going to make it stand out. But in actuality, the best way to attract an agent is just by writing a really solid query letter. And then the third thing is is the flip side of my advice in the in the first one, which is you know just being too vague and and not really getting across what makes the story unique. In order to do that, I really recommend avoiding themes and and what the book means, and instead focus in on what happens and and what's unique about the world of of this novel. Um, so yeah. 
Thanks, Nathan. And I want to loop back to your book on how to write a novel, uh, which is, I love the subtitle especially, but how to write a novel, 49 rules for writing a stupendously awesome novel that you will love forever, which as Grant said, is our goal for everyone. So is there a favorite writing tip from that book? I, I think the, the most important one is to write the book you love and not the book that you think you should write. Um, I see a lot of times where, where there's this, so every, people have this, this nagging idea about this book, but it just kind of seems crazy to them. Like the idea seems a little bit like ludicrous, like the, maybe it goes against the grain of what's popular right now. Um, and then people instead end up writing the, the novel that they think is going to be more commercial or that they sh feel like they should write because of circumstances of, of, of their biography, perhaps, or background. And to me, the only way you're actually going to finish a novel is if you're writing a book you love, because writing a book is extremely hard. And the only way you're going to really get to the end is if you're writing a book that you truly love, because you got to ha have something you can dig deep um, and reach in order to to get through the hardest parts of the novel, which is probably around this time. If if uh, people are um, you know midway through uh, NaNoWriMo, it's like it's that pesky middle and and where the end still feels a little bit far away, but you're trying to juggle all of these different plot points and maybe you've lost a thread or two, and it starts getting really challenging, and the novelty of writing is worn off, and it's just gotten really really hard. The only thing that that will get you through that time is because you're 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 tying it back to some deep love you have for the your book idea yeah that's the same advice i always give love that yeah. book and it'll help you get through the the middle Absolutely. of uh, there'll be many middles actually yeah, no it's true it's true yeah <laughs> being in the middle of uh revisions is also a really painful place but um but yeah we'll cross that bridge when we get there yeah yeah well, in closing, I, you, you haven't written a book, 49 Tips for Getting Published, but in many ways, I think your blog probably has a good 49 tips or yeah. more on it. So in closing, I was wondering, what are the three most important things that writers should do to get published in your mind, maybe beyond the query letter, what, which we've talked about? Actually, I do have a guide to publishing a book that ju was just uh, published on December 3rd. Oh, wow. Um, it's called How to Publish a Book, 41 Rules for Successfully Publishing a Book that You Will love forever i believe is subtitle is i sometimes have trouble remembering my own subtitles but it has everything uh you need to uh navigate the traditional and self-publishing process so check that out um but yeah my, my the three tips i have for how to, to navigate this process is one i really think uh it's so important that people treat this like a business and treat it like a second job in a way. And um, it's not enough to just write a book um, and just trust that um, the publishing you know, professionals are going to just take care of the rest. Um, it's really important to learn the business, to stay abreast of industry news, to keep tabs on what agents are saying, and to, and to really kind of do the work that goes alongside the writing. And um, I think a lot of people have this sense that there was this time in the past when writers could just write, but I don't think that was ever really true. There was always, you know, hoops that people had to jump through and marketing that had to be done and things like that. The second thing is to really get in touch with your goals and what you want for your book, because there's so many different avenues to having your book out there than ever before. And they all have different pros and cons. You know, traditional publishing can be amazing. You know, there's the cachet. They tend to pay you in advance. You'll be shepherded through the process by professionals. Um, but it can also take a really, really long time. And you lose a, a degree of control over the over the process. And the whole, the whole process is super uncertain. You might spend a year or two trying to find agents or trying to find a publisher, and it might just not happen in that two years. Um, you know, go, is a long time. Uh, whereas self-publishing, you know, you have to do a lot more yourself, but you have your book out there and you can try and reach readers directly. And so there are a lot of pros and cons to both sides. And so just get in touch with what's really important to you. And on my blog, I have a few, I have questions to ask yourself if you're on the fence about which path to pursue. And the, the third thing is to just really try and enjoy the process and try and avoid tying your sort of overall happiness and your um, your mentality to any one outcome. Um, I call it the if only game where you, you start to think, oh, if only I could just finish this novel, then I'll be happy and proud and, and I'll be satisfied. And then you finish and then you're like, oh, but wait, now if I could just find this agent, then I'll be happier. And then if only I just find this editor and it just keeps going and going and it's a spiral that will never lead to 
to happiness. And so the only way to really survive the process, which inevitably comes with a huge amount of rejection, is just to try and enjoy every step of the process, whether that's writing, whether that's trying to find an agent or trying to find a publisher or surviving bad reviews, you know, just trying to really just trust that you've written the best book you can. The market's going to do what it's going to do and, um, and just try and enjoy every moment. And believe me, I mean, (laughs) easier said than done. I mean, I was an agent and when my book went on submission to publishers, I was curled up on a ball on the floor a week and a half into the process, even though I know it usually takes longer than that. So this, this advice I'm giving is easier said than followed. But if you can just try and avoid tying your happiness to some outcome that's outside of your control, um, I think it's going to get you through and you'll be much more satisfied with the process. Thanks so much, Nathan. Those are great words of wisdom. Thanks so much, Nathan. Thanks so much for having me. All right, everybody. We'll be right back with today's takeaway. Today's takeaway is about sleuthing, so it's going to be super fun. Uh, It applies to your agent search as well. It's my favorite part of the agent search. So to start, make a short list of your favorite authors in the category you're writing in. So if you're writing horror, choose, you know, five to eight authors who are horror writers and research who their agents are. So you can do this by, as we mentioned earlier, um, looking in the acknowledgements of their books that are usually listed. I think these days you can just do an internet search and pretty quickly find um, the information on the on the author website in the contact information or uh, their publisher sometimes lists it. So while you're sleuthing, take notes on what authors the agents uh, represent. Uh, they usually have a long client list. Uh, get a sense of who they are, what kinds of uh, works they like to represent, see how you fit into that. I usually get curious and go beyond just the individual agent I'm researching and poke around the agency itself to see who else works there. You know, um, I like to see if there are other junior agents who might be more appropriate for me and like to see who they represent and what they're looking for. And this is all just to help you start making a list of possible agents that you might query when you're ready to publish and to make it a little bit more welcoming. You'll know some tidbits of, of who represents who after the process. Thanks for that, Grant. And a reminder, as always, that Right Minded is a weekly podcast. And we've been talking about our reviews and we've been saying how much we read them and that occasionally we want to share them with you, which we very rarely do. So I want to read one because this is like my favorite kind of headline. It says, I love this podcast. This is from Tracy M. She says, I feel like I'm hanging out with two uber smart writers and getting their best advice. As a writer, I face all the fears about my art and sharing it with the world. Brooke and Grant helped me realize that all of this is normal, and I love the interviews too. Keep them coming. Wow. I know, right? Doesn't that feel yeah, good? It's like you, two Tracy. smart writers. Yeah, so we appreciate it, you guys. We are reading them. We keep talking about how it helps us gain visibility, which is really the thing that helps us to continue to keep doing what we're doing. So that's why it matters. So thank you. Thank you. And we will see you next week. <laughs>